<laughs> and now, another edition of Tony Tolato on Sci-Fi Talk. Kind of like Samwise Gamgee from Lord of the Rings, the character I played. Um, <laughs> but I remember him. An oldie but a goodie, folks. <laughs> Julian Sands is a creepy man. <laughs> <laughs> Who is your master, Padawan? Someone I killed, perhaps? <laughs> wow. Hey, that's great. I appreciate it, I do. <laughs> My guy, the Archangel Gabriel, <laughs> is in... Uh... <laughs> wow, that was early. <laughs> What is most important um, is that Burnham forgives herself. Because as Burnham, I carry a tremendous amount of guilt and shame. Well, my name is Alex Sahara. I played a, a raven god, Zales, to um, Iron Shirt, the uh, one eyed Unas freaky leader. So, Coca Ca Unas. Woman Coca Ca Unas. Over there is sci fi talk. <laughs> typical typical sci fi talk, talk. Talk behavior. Special effects and what's it like for you both to kind of act to things that aren't there? Well, you know, sometimes you have that experience anyway with people that are there. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> <laughs> Not <like> that bad. <laughs> In part because of the hopeful nature of Jean's vision, but also because of its message of diversity and inclusion. Live long and prosper. Hi, this is Tony Tolado. Sandman. Definitely one of the signature works in Neil Gaiman's body of work. It's always something that has been talked about being made into a film or a TV series, and that still could see the light of day with the possibility of it arriving on Netflix. And one place it is going for sure is on audio. Audible is producing a very ambitious version of Sandman with an all-star cast led by James McAvoy. I participated along with other reporters, and you'll hear all of their questions, and you'll hear mine, as we discuss this monumental work, bringing the character of Morpheus, or the dream, in Sandman to life. And here is James McAvoy talking about that very character. He definitely had to be not human. He definitely had to be something different. He's, he doesn't understand the human experience. Um... And yet he serves the human experience and he's very connected. He's, he's a part of the human experience. He's a, he's a function almost of the human experience or he provides a vital need for uh, humanity, you know. So he's very connected to humanity and at the same time quite different and distant from humanity. But you don't want to fall into the trap of sort of playing Spock, you know what I mean? Sort of playing that Vulcan character who's like, who sees stuff in such a non-emotional way that isn't really interesting, and I, I really don't think it would be that interesting on radio either. I think what's really was key to tie tap into was the fact that he's been tortured for such a long time at the beginning of the story. He's been he's been stripped naked. He's been all his power and all his strength and all the things that make him feel valid. You know, I mean, they've all been taken away from him for decades. He's been trapped and tortured in a little cave, and essentially a little cave, trying to, all right, he's not human, but he is something slightly broken, and he is somebody who's unsure of himself again, coming out of this thing. And, and those are all things that I think we can relate to as human beings. Those are those are experiences, emotions, and contexts that we can identify with. So even though he is very, very different, he's actually going through a fairly relatable human experience as well. So there's going to be growth and there's going to be self-realization for him uh, that in some way I think still allows us to connect to him even though he is this other thing, you know. What was it about the Sandman that drew him to this work? You could offer me like the worst part in the most inappropriate Thing that I could be cast in of any of Neil Gaiman's things, I'd probably still say yes, because I just love the world that he creates, the strange, fantastic, quite scary and controversial at times world that he creates. And um, and so that was it's a no-brainer, really, like then and there. But I knew that Dirk Mags is not only somebody who's just a great guy directing audio drama, He's quite rock and roll, and he's got something very similar 
to kneel. And I don't know what that is. There's just a kind of certain something, a certain sort of try and just push the boat out kind of attitude, which in radio drama where you are limited to just the audio and where you don't have that visual leading, you you really need somebody to be bold and and he has such a deep understanding of, of Neil's work that I just knew it was going to be a good marriage. Me, personally, what I love about Gaiman's writing, these strange, fantastical worlds, but actually characters that we can identify with, even if they are the lord of the dream realm, and they are <laughs> strangely uh, not human. There's something that just compels you and brings you into them and into these crazy weird adventures that you go on. The other thing as well is a lot of Neil's stories are, you know, classic narratives, but that these are more episodic and there is there is each week a new adventure almost. And there's just something really fun about that because you get to put Morpheus and all these other amazing characters into different situations every single week, and that's that's really fun too. James, what I've always admired about you, you've always challenged yourself in every part you've taken. Would you say this one ranks up there as one of the challenging roles you've had to do? It's definitely challenging. Just for some of those reasons that I was talking about earlier, really, you know, he's he's detached from humanity. You can't make him just sound like an everyday human guy, um, try to go about the business of being a dream lord. You've got to you've got to make him feel different, feel regal, feel special, and yet he is the through line. He is the one character that takes you through most of the the season so at the same time he's got to be relatable in some ways and uh and that's a tricky and fine line to to walk also i don't know neil had said that he wanted him to sound classical and he wanted him to sound almost like he was speaking shakespeare's verse or something like that at times which of course not all the dialogue allows for but there's there's moments of almost kind of poetry in there too and we try to go for that I don't know if Dirk ended up using it, but we went for it quite hard at some point. And we tried to kind of really get some good rhythm in there and some almost like some beat in there as well. But I don't know if he went for that, but that was really challenging because it felt like sometimes the material wanted to lend itself to that so easily. And sometimes it felt like we were trying to bend the material to kind of like fit our cool idea. So we'll have to see if any of that worked and if Dirk ended up <laughs> leaving it on the editing room floor. Did you record this piece with the other actors? Actually, I recorded this all entirely in uh, my spare bedroom during the month of April after the lockdown hit. I was doing a play. Uh, I was doing Cyrano de Bergerac in the West End and um, when I was meant to be recording this, but I just called up Dirk and I said, listen, man, my voice is Banjax so, from the play, so can we maybe do this after I've finished the play? Which was, I think, 29th of February was this year leap year I think it was a leap year as such can we do it in March and so we set it for like the 17th of March or something like that and Boris Johnson announced the lockdown on the 16th of March um, but the good thing about that was that by the time I got to uh, record in my spare room where I built a sort of makeshift recording studio the rest of the cast had already laid down their performances. Every single cast member had done their job except me. So I got to be in the, the position that I've never been before in my entire career where I got to listen to the entire show um, before I recorded my work. And it was awesome. It was absolutely fantastic. It was so good. Morpheus needs to have something. Yeah, he has to have a kind of gravity. And... uh and a regality. <laughs> regality is regality. Um, um, and yet, at the same time, you can just state play that. You can just sort of, you can just make that a kind of general state that you play and it becomes uninteresting, you know? So how do you make somebody who's so detached from humanity, who is so regal, who is so stoic at times, how do you make that interesting to you? The human beings who want to watch drama generally to watch somebody go through a crisis or go through a change or I mean the, the backbone of most drama is watching somebody go through something that changes them you know what I mean and so really grasping on to the elements that are in the script which are that he's been tortured and he's 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 been abused and and he's trying to put himself back together and he won't let himself be attacked like that again um and not from his brothers and sisters, not from not from anyone. Trying to sort of take ownership of his his 
duties, his role, but also just his life again as well. So those are the things that hopefully add layers to that stoicism and that um, classical regal kind of quality that he just had to have, you know. His lines included narration besides the dialogue. It, it was kind of cool. And what was really nice is, like, sometimes Neil is narrating it, and then sometimes I'm narrating it. And it's sort of really, it was just kind of a thrill for me as a fan to get to share that duty with Neil himself. Um, so it was quite nice handing that back and forth between the two of us. Um, no, I quite like it. I like that it was... It's not just about acting. It was also about storytelling. And that's really how he sees those dreams as well. I think those moments where he narrates, where Morpheus narrates, he's somehow trying to reclaim his journey, his experience again after being so tortured and abused. And, and they were sort of moments for him to sort of be aware of what he's going through and, and, and relay that to the listener and to humanity in general that he's, whose dreams he is, he's traveling through and, and sort of the enjoyment of that as well, like owning it again, you know? He compares his role of Morpheus to his role in Neverwhere, another Neil Gaiman audio production he did. The scenes are shorter, um, and, um, the character is vastly different. Yeah. So, before I was playing such an everyman who um I can't remember the name of the character and never were off the top of my head. Um but he was also he was Scottish and he was a kind of an everyman. He was like a a, a normal guy in a world gone mad. Um uh, whereas which was quite easy for me to play because it's quite similar to who I am in so many ways. And you know, if I was in that situation I may well react in those exact same ways in the land of Neverwhere. But um but with Morpheus, he he's not a normal man in a world gone mad. He's a he's a crazy madman in a in a world gone normal, you know. And he's the one making it mad in a lot of ways. And it's almost his role and his duty to keep it mad, and which is awesome. That's a challenge in itself because you've got you have to honour the fact that he's so different, that he's not human, that he is so strange. Uh, but you can't just do strange acting either. Do you know what I mean? It, there were very very different challenges. Um, I guess, I guess it was just really, like I say, I'm sorry to keep harping on it, but it's just the thing I keep coming back to, just, just grasping on to the elements of Morpheus that are similar to those of the common human being, or the, the elements of the journey that are similar that we could identify with and, and sympathize with, and grasping on those, he could just become so alien and so odd that actually it's just hard to listen to, you know? James, as far as an as an actor to prepare to start the recording, do you warm up a little bit to kind of say, ah, there he is, and then you start reading, or what's the process like for you? We started experimenting to begin with, just with tone and register and sort of depth of of birth, I guess, and we kind of hit on something a little bit deeper than my own voice, a, a speed of of thought almost uh, not just a speech but a speed of thought that was slower and more contemplative someone who has been alive for millennia and actually longer than millennia like trillennia <laughs> um, that then sort of informed you know your speed of thought you don't maybe you don't need to think as quickly you can take a longer time to formulate a response and and that became quite interesting and so that deeper tone and that slower thought process really formed the backbone of how he reacted to situations. And it was quite easy to identify when it felt authentic and when it felt like I was just being a bit too normal, just generally because I, I would get more high pitched and I would get faster. And we'd be like, no, 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 try and bring it back, try and bring it back to Morpheus and not just my reaction to a situation, you know. There's more with James McAvoy on Sandman in just a moment. I'm Peter Weller, and you're listening to Sci-Fi Talk. Back on Sci-Fi Talk, as we look at Sandman with James McAvoy. As I said, this is part of a roundtable I participated in. Were you a fan of the graphic novels, and do you have a favorite? Yeah, no, I don't have a favorite. Uh, I mean, the Corinthian, the whole thing with him at the Torturers Convention was just terrifying when I was a teenager when I first read it. Um, so that's probably the one that's lasted with me. I don't think I've got a favourite, but that's the one that sort of, when people spoke to me about Sandman, 
that was the one that stuck in my mind more than anything else. That speech that, that Morpheus has to them, I can't remember it off the top of my head either, but where he basically just says, you know, you guys think you're special and you're just nothing. You know, it's incredible. It's so good. I read it when I was 14. Uh, I read the first, I think, 10, I think. And I loved them. I absolutely loved them. But I was more into novels at that point. I didn't read a lot of comic books and graphic novels. I don't know why. They weren't particularly available to me. Maybe I didn't seek them out, but I didn't feel like they were that um, available, really, when I was growing up in Glasgow. But those ones stuck with me real, like... And I suppose that's what then led me on to reading Neil's work and reading American Gods, reading Good Omens and... and uh, never aware and all that when I was in my teens. Um, Good Omens just blew my mind, which was he wrote with Terry Pratchett. Um, uh, I was a fan, but I kept, don't think I could pinpoint which one was my favorite. Is there more of a satisfaction to build a character from the ground up? Yeah, totally. You feel like you've got to be able to satisfy the image or the sound, in this case, that the audience have in their head, and you have to honor that, but you also kind of you're liberated by the fact that those images and those sounds they've been created in the imaginations of literally millions and millions of people and their versions of that character can be vastly different uh, from person to person depending on how they respond to the material so there's a little bit of liberation in there uh, you've got to try and honor the kind of the general thing that we all sort of build in the collective subconscious of what that character should be like but at the same time you can't just satisfying that you've got to you've got to give something of yourself and something of your response and hopefully something surprising at times uh, for an audience as well so it is tricky you do feel that but then you get into the booth and you start recording and really it's just you and Dirk and the material and your response to the character that takes over and that weight of responsibility and any kind of tension or anxiety that you might feel about whether you can deliver it or not they kind of disappear because I'm used to doing that and that's my job you know what I mean if I was worried about what the audience thought the whole time uh, about whether they like it or not then you'd never give them anything truly of yourself which is really what all great performance is you want to get a performer giving you something that comes from them, that comes from their truth and their response to the material, and then communicate that to the audience. Because if you're just worried about the audience the whole time, then I don't know. You get a kind of you get a, you get a tension between the performer and the audience that just stops any any good moment or any good moment of communion happening. You know, James, when you approach a character, do you try to find a little bit of yourself in them, or do you just kind of clear your head and, and and let them speak to you? Yeah, I think I clear my head and let them speak to me a lot of the time. Look, there's characters that I've played that, that have had elements of them that are so me uh, that it's hard to not find the correlation to my own life and my own experience and, and all of that. But um, the, even the characters that really don't, I can't identify or I can't um, find a, an overlay for or find a shared experience with, you just trust the story. And if the story is compelling and the story is really well fleshed out, it, if I open myself up to the story and the character, then yeah, it's just your response to them hopefully carries you through. And your empathy and your compassion for that character make you connect with it and imagine what it's like to go through those scenarios and, and have a, a hopefully a, a, a compelling and visceral response uh, to that, uh, even if you don't have to share the experience, you know. As a follow-up, would you say it's a bit of a leap of faith? Yeah, totally. Every <laughs> time every time you step on stage, every time you step in front of a camera or in front of a microphone, you're risking your <laughs> reputation as somebody who can entertain, who can act. Um, so it's always a leap of faith. But I think when you work on somebody like... Uh, on the material of somebody like Neil Gaiman and you're working with somebody like Dirk Maggs and in the stellar company that this cast ended up being I had no idea it was going to be such an incredible cast but when I got the cast list through like I say before I'd even recorded anything I was like I better be good because these guys are all amazing um, but when you're in that kind of company and you're working on that kind of material it's far less of a leap of faith because you know that something interesting is going to happen even if it doesn't work something interesting is going to happen you know he talks about choosing roles and also doing audio work. I guess a consumer, I love audio work. 
um, it's look, it's not as satisfying as, as using every single facet of your being to tell a story, to be physical, to be visual, to be vocal, to be all those things is obviously more, um, I get to express myself more when it's not just my voice. But there is something quite pure about going, right, I'm only allowed to use one one of my um, attributes, one of my physical attributes to be able to tell this story. Like if it was just dance and it's just a physical thing, that would be so deeply interesting. You go like, how can I convey all the things I usually do, but only through dance? Well, it's the same with vocal work. That's all you've got. And it's, it's something quite focusing about it and quite taxing about it. Uh, and actually gives you an opportunity to flex different muscles, more muscles, but in one specific area and hopefully learn more. But as a consumer, as a as an audience member, I love audio work and I, I kind of consume it quite voraciously. Um, and, you know, the amount of traveling I have to do, the amount of, just as a father, the amount of housework I have to do, uh, they would all be sort of fucking torturous if it went for the radio drama and the audio books that I fly through. Um, so it was, it was, it is something that I want to do anyway. I do want to keep the type of work that I do very. I don't think I'd become, maybe I would become bored if it wasn't so very, but I feel so many performers get stuck in a rut of, even when they're successful, just doing the same old thing again and again and again. And I've been very fortunate in my career not to have to go through that experience. So it's something that I really try and embrace and cultivate. And I get a lot of excitement in my daily business just by mixing it up. So yeah, I'll, I will continue to do that. It's something I do do on purpose. And I turn down a lot of work, not because it's bad, but just because I feel like I've just done that. Do you know what I mean? Sorry, I missed you Thank in you. Cyrano. Oh man, don't worry about it. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, they did, they recorded it in one of those really cool sort of multi-camera recorded things. So it might be on in a cinema near you one day if we ever get the cinemas open again. Yeah, that sounds mm. great. Thank you. Yeah. All the best, you guys. All the best, James. Look for Sandman on audio at audible.com. Some very good sounds. As I said, a very ambitious project, an all-star cast. I'm looking forward to it, especially listening to Michael Sheen, voice of David Bowie like Lucifer. That should be interesting. Special thanks to Farron Communications and Audible. This is Tony Tolato. Thanks for listening. Hello, I am C-3PO Human-Cyborg Relations, and you are listening to Sci-Fi Talk. Gosh!